three. Hello everyone, welcome to the Bearded Mystic Podcast and we're here again for the new Sanatana Dharma roundtable discussion which is um, basically talking about different traditions that we're from. We're all from different traditions, we follow different gurus and you know uh, some of these uh, familiar faces from the last one uh, which is obviously Shivaji. Uh, Brahmananji, Edwin G, Liam G, and we have a new guest, uh, Vince of York. Or, and um, I'll just ask Vince to just give a short introduction into the philosophy that he follows, and then we'll go into the questions. Sure, thank you. And thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate y'all. Um, so the tradition I follow now is Advaita Vedanta, but I grew up as a Catholic, um, then was an atheist, hardcore atheist for about 17 years. And then uh, I was reading, you know, uh, Sam Harris material and which got me into meditation, which got me later on into Sanatana Dharma, um, which is, um, but I followed the Advaita Vedanta path. Um, but I also follow Madhyana Buddhism. Um, I also incorporate a little bit of my understanding from Sufism, which is, uh, you know, Sufi mysticism and some Christian mysticism. So I pull from you know, uh, I'm not just very strict in one um, direction, but however, I do um, mostly adhere to Advaita Vedanta, no doubt about it. It all comes from there. So, Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Vince, for that wonderful yes. introduction. And, and again, thank you for joining us. Thank you to all of you for joining. I really, really appreciate it. So the first question um, that I wanted to ask is, should scriptures be taken literally uh, and then give your reasons why to uh, to that uh, uh, to that question to your answer. Uh, so we'll start with Shivaji, and we'll go across. He may be missing. No worries. Uh, we'll go to you, Brimananji. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm sorry. I'm here. I oh. I think I. <laughs> sure. Yes. Uh, should scriptures be taken literally? Yes, and also no. A lot of the scriptures uh, that you can read should be taken literally because they're meant to be taken literally, and a lot of them are not because they're metaphorical. And uh, Yes. Should someone read the scriptures for one's realization, one's attainment? And this is a more a juicy question. Juicy question. I would advise people to stay away from reading books in general if you want spiritual attainment because spirituality is not about reading books or reading scriptures as uh, blasphemous as it may seem. It's about energy. Spirituality is about energy. So the Buddha had a great quote here. The Buddha said that the soup, the spoon can't taste the soup no matter how much you put the spoon in the soup, it can't taste it. It has to have a tongue to taste the soup. So to me, in my experience, people that read too much, they get cluttered with what they think is right, and they have no deep, direct perception. Spirituality is not about scripture. It's not about books. Books and scriptures are the last resort. That's where you go if you have no real anything left. That's what I did in the beginning of my journey because I had no teacher, I had no person to guide me, I had, I had nothing inside of me, so I had to read. But now looking back at it, I want to shed all of that. I want to dissolve everything that I've learned, all the scriptures that I've learned, it's worthless to me. Because if you get in contact with the actual source of creation, with the energy that holds everything together, everything is known. The scriptures aren't here. They're not made to be read in a book. So I have a fascinating little story here I want to share with you, and I'll end, end it with this, is that uh, during the Buddha's time, when the Buddha first started teaching, he said, monks, you need to investigate death. You need to look at the body. You need to look how this whole system has been structured. You need to see what happens after you pass away. One day after you pass away, two days, three days, 10 days, 14 days, 40 days, how the rotting process starts. You need to totally be disconnected and dispassionate from the body. And so the monks did that. And then one day the Buddha said, okay, monks, I have to go into the woods now for one month and do Buddha stuff. I have to leave you alone for a little bit, but you stay put, you continue practicing. 
And that's exactly what the Buddha did. When he came back, a lot of the monks decided to leave the body, meaning uh, not in a wholesome spiritual way, but basically finishing themselves. So that's the danger of just reading something or just following something along that without an actual live presence. So a spiritual teacher can be like a fire. It's such a huge source of safety. And uh, everyone here should seek that out. And it doesn't even have to be in a physical form. There are so many energetic structures in India that you can go to that you benefit from. So uh, that's my two cents. Thank you, Shivaji. Um, before we go to you, Brahmin and Nandaji, um, any rebuttals that we may have, we can do at the end after everyone's spoken. Um, I'll leave some time for that. Uh, Brahmin and Nandaji. Om Shri Krishna Sharana Mama. Hello to everyone. It's good to see you all again. And uh, to those of you who are viewing, um, thank you for coming back. Um, so we were given these questions beforehand, and this one I have thought about a lot because the scriptures are something that I'm reading on my YouTube channel along with doing a weekly show where I just talk about things. And I think about them a lot. Should we take them literally? Yes, no, and whatever. So I created some things which uh, I jotted down. So mind me for reading off some notes here. Uh, so we could answer this question by referring to scripture itself and to see what the scripture says. But the thing is, scriptures always validate themselves. Whatever the religion you're in, they are always going to say, yes, you should take me literally, or maybe you should take this prose figuratively. Um, but they're always going to say that. So they're really not a good judge of themselves. <laughs> um, we could also answer this question by looking at them historically. But we run into some problems. We run into the historical record, which brings up questions of their legitimacy. And if they aren't legitimate, should we take them literally or should we even believe in them? For example, it is believed that the Mahabharata was written and then the Bhagavad Gita was added afterwards. So then is that a legit true story? Some people say no, some people say yes. <clears throat> we also run into the problem of translations we're reading a translation we have to trust that our translator is really good but we could have a bad translation so what we think is scriptures is really not what was written so many years ago so for me this question has so many elements that could keep us here all night long <laughs> but the way i tend to look at the big picture is I refer to Christianity. And this may not be the best example, but it's one that we are all familiar with. We all know the basic history of it. So it's therefore the, the best example in this situation. We all know that the Bible requires Jesus to be a true person who died on the cross. If he did not die, then there is no blood of Christ to save us from our sins and we are sinners. You kind of need that to happen. If the Bible was fake, there's no Jesus, there's no blood, and the whole religion kind of just crumbles. So then I look at that, and I turn to our scriptures, which I've read a lot of, and I don't see any event that requires us to believe in it in order to say, I am Hindu, or I am a Sanatana Dharma, or I am something. There's nothing there for me that says you must believe this. Otherwise, nope, you can't be a part of this religion or it doesn't work or the religion falls apart. No <laughs> one died for us. Um, Krishna walked the earth. But if you don't believe in Krishna, that's OK. If you don't believe in Ganesha, that's kind of OK. You can still be a functioning member of our religious community as welcoming as anyone else. Um, I know it sounds weird to say you might be an atheist, but. I think there is a little room for that in some way, shape, or form. Or maybe you're not an atheist, but you think some of the stories aren't quite valid. They have historical elements mix mixed with fictional elements. So they're more like a, a Jack Kerouac book or a Gore Vidal book or something. 
I think though that is how I I would I, I have to rephrase the question. It's not so much should they be taken literally, but for me, it's almost like does it matter? Does it even matter in the first place whether they should be taken literally or not? Um, you know, I can build a complete house without taking the uh, a complete spiritual house without taking the Ramayana a hundred percent literal or the Mahabharata or whatever. Um, so what happens is just to draw a conclusion here. Um, for me, it's very possible that uh, Sanatana Dharma is not a religion based on actual gods that exist. It could be something more like Confucianism, or it's a divinely inspired philosophy with some historical events. Um, in that case, it's up to you what you want to do. Um, so that's actually how I tend to answer this. Um, in that vague, roundabout, long answer, um, simply because depending upon what day it is, I actually sometimes say, yes, you should take them literally, and sometimes you, I say, no, you should not. And today is a good day, and I'm just not going to say anything. <laughs> so there's my answer for that. Back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Premananji. Edwinji? Thank you, Aya. Um... For me, um, I would say on, depending on the scripture, um, but I would say overall, definitely take it literally. But at the same time, it's not something, when I say literal, I do not mean um, that like it is an absolute or an absolutist aspect because none of Sanatana Dharma is an absolutist. It's always able to be questioned, refined, adapted, the rishis have been doing that for thousands of years, uh, continuously. You know, it's, it's not a religion of the book. And so because it's not a religion of the book, um, we have millions of texts that are more of a instruction manual, um, guideposts. Um, they provide instruction on how to apply, like the agamas, how to apply the sciences of the yogic and Vedic practices to achieve certain ends, right? And so when you apply it, you can, if it doesn't work for you, change it to a way that applies for you. Um, and some of the stuff that they did a certain way was because at the time they had limited resources or they did it like a yogi might have gone and done something up in the mountains and he only had certain materials on hand to do it. And that's why he did it that way. But to achieve the same result in modern, you may have a more modern uh, tool to achieve the same result. Um, and so uh, it's the process, if applied and you get the same outcome, even if the process is slightly tweaked, it's it works. So I would say like for the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, all that is like actual history that happened. Um, I, I do think that there may be some allegorical aspects to certain parts of like the stories that Krishna tells, etc. But like the events themselves absolutely happened. Um, and that the, the devas and devatas and the bhagavans and the, the, the avatars did come down in flesh to actually enlighten the world. So, and that these, these wars and all these things did happen. Uh, so I take those personally um, as literal. And I, uh, when it comes to the story and the history uh, that the Vedas put out, um, and I do say to use the, the, do the instructions literally, but at the same time, you will always need a master um, uh, that can guide you on both the interpretation of how to apply it in a either modern sense and or in a more practical sense um, and are able to discern things on a deeper level that you may have not been able to deduce from the information that you're taking literally from those texts. And so that's where I would go on that. I could speak much longer, but I'll keep it simple. Thank you, Edwin G. Liam G. Hello, I'm happy to be here. I also wanted to welcome Vince and that I had a moment. So happy to have you here, my friend. Um, 
I think one of the most beautiful things about Eastern spirituality and philosophy in general is that it's primarily uh, one that you get to experience firsthand. It's definitely a tradition built on coming and seeing for yourself. And I found a lot of the time that what I read in Scripture, what I hear from Scripture, simply validates experience more than telling you something you don't already know, that it's there to not have an authority over your own, but really speak the deepest truths of your own heart. And that's an important um, aspect of it. But I don't know if anyone's ever read, read the Vedas directly yourself. If you have, then you might know that it's it's, it's kind of like gibberish a little bit. <laughs> I mean, it's full of, of rich metaphors and symbolism that definitely requires unpacking. I mean, we wouldn't have the tradition of Vedanta, the philosophical interpretation of the Vedas at all. We wouldn't have the Brahma Sutras, the Upanishads that take something like a pastoral metaphor about cows and crops and then turns it into this elaborate exposition about why reincarnation is a truth and how Atma is beyond the Maya. And it's like, wow, you can get all of this from a pastoral metaphor? If we were just taking it literally, you know, it might, it might sound like an account of some history of kings or some uh, taxonomy or, or account of some crop harvest. I don't know. I know there's a lot of Western analysis that takes the Vedas really literally and they come up with all these conclusions that seem to contradict the Upanishads and the Brahma Sutras and the philosophical tradition that has stemmed from it. So I think in that aspect, we would be denying the rich um, poetry of the Rishis, that they were able to either have these poet poems revealed to them or come up with such beautiful terms that's able to encode such mystical truths in a very um in a very elegant and allegorical manner and that's not to deny the the history of it but it's just to put the historicity as secondary to the spiritual meaning history can help you gain a kind of reverence to wherever you are like there's many cities and places in india which are named after various events and kingdoms that exist in various mythological stories and regardless of whether they're literally true they kind of bring a, a sort of reverence to your geography to your tradition and stories have always been a way in which we've encoded truth you know certain scriptures speak to the intellect but stories speak to the heart and regardless of whether these stories are literally true or not they still have an important part in our tradition Thank you, Liam G. Vince G. Okay, I'm unmuted now. All right, great. So should they be taken literally? It depends. Um, so if you are an Advaita Vedanta practitioner and you're extremely logically minded, then as we say in Buddhism, sometimes it takes a thorn to remove a thorn. So sometimes it will take stringent logic to remove you from the logic for which you're already programmed to believe in. So if you under, so I'll say it like this, if you understand Sanskrit, it's very non-dualistic. So if you can understand non-duality and you understand Sanskrit, then yes, you can take it literally. But if you're translating it into a Western mindset and using a dualistic mindset to translate something that is non-dual and is almost non-translatable, because in the West, we have a very military chain of command way of reasoning about the world. And I can go on about why that is, but we don't have to do that now. And so if you want to study non-duality and the difference between non-duality and duality, and you want to go into Wittgenstein and Nagarjuna and, and Shankara and really study the languages, um, then, you can, then you can take it literally, as long as you can have discernment between the duality and the non-duality, and you can translate it and understand it for yourself. But I wanted to say one more thing um, as far as what um, the, or the original person that spoke, I'm sorry, I can't see the names at the moment, um, um, but he, may, he said something very important um, about how we can read something and it could be very philosophical. And there's a major difference between 
something that's philosophical and something that is practical. Uh, so let me give you an example. I can philosophize about going to the gym all I want. But until I actually go to the gym, it is like night and day. Philosophizing about going to the gym is not going to give you the experience of going to the gym. So in that sense, you can you can collect all the philosophies you want in your head, but until you actually embody the understanding and put it to it, the, the practice, it's it's going to be sort of half empty in, in a way. It's, it's not going to it's not going to sort of be completed, in my opinion. So thank you. Thank you, Vince Jean. Thank you, everyone, for your answers. Um, and, and really, just to add on to the discussion, I, I think quite a few people forget when they read the scriptures, it is poetry, actually. Um, the Rishis, another name for the Rishis is Govi, and Govi means a poet. So because it's poetry, you can't literally take it literally. It would be going against what poetry is. Um, I remember reading a book by Stephen Fry, and he said that poetry is like allowing the chocolate to melt in your mouth. And, you know, really taking in the flavors of the chocolate instead of, you know, biting into the chocolate and finishing it and forgetting about it. Poetry has to, you have to stay with it. You have to stay with the words and see what's beyond them what it's pointing to um you know those words are pointing to the higher truth are we grasping that higher truth or are we still looking at it very literally and and actually not doing service to it uh, I, I, as vince uh, g said that you know if you take those you know some of those words are non-translatable like brahman is actually non-translatable you cannot we can say ultimate reality, we can say awareness, but it doesn't actually really take in what that word really means, what that term means. So, uh, and that can only be given in two ways. One, uh, I believe through a guru, and, um, and I, I really believe a master can really help in that process. The other way is just real, like real study of the scripture. I'm not meaning by just reciting it and being able to memorize it, not that, but actually really studying it and exploring what it truly means within you and allowing those words to really stir, um, as we mentioned, in the heart. So, um, but one caveat I'm gonna say is I would use this methodology only for the Upanishads or texts like the Gita or the Ashtavakra Gita, I wouldn't use this for the Puranas, uh, you know, whether that's the Bhagavad Purana, the Shiv Purana, I do not believe they should be taken as literally because as we've just said, they have rich metaphors and we have to understand what the metaphors mean rather than taking it very literally. And then, you know, if people are going to start believing 10 arrows shot, uh, um, you know, was uh, shot from one, uh, one arrow from the bow, you know, it, it's, it's going to look silly. Uh, we have to understand what that really means, the power of that one uh, sh shot of the arrow, what that really signifies. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, those are my few um, thoughts. We can open the uh, floor for any rebuttals, anything we disagreed with or agreed with and elaborate. Um, I'll let anyone go first. Is that me? Uh, uh, yes, go on. Um, I would also say that another way to um, truly know what Brahman is, is experience. So that would be a third one. So um, there are many uh, uh, practices within Sanatana Dharma that will allow you to experience, get to the state where you can experience Brahman, um, and thus you know. It's not something you can then articulate, but you then know you're able to conceptually retain your experience, even if you cannot articulate it. And so that is one there. Um, and, and again, <clears throat> uh, I would say that I, I understand where you're going with the, you know, calling the Rishis poets and yeah, that is a translation. I would also call them scientists ancient scientists so and that's a whole nother discussion for another time 
but um, their ability uh, to create and provide, uh, bring down and articulate the knowledge and know and provide us with knowledge of things that only modern day, uh, even modern day scientists is only theorizing they haven't even proven but it's within like quantum physics and quantum mechanics some of that stuff was talked about by the the ancient rishis in the texts and so that's why i call one of the reasons why i explain it them as ancient scientists right and so um there there's much more to that um but uh what was the other thing I was going to go off of? Uh, okay, so for me, like I said, the, you called the Vedas and the, um, what was the other one? Poetry, and then the, the, um, the which one did you call? Um, uh, uh, the Puranas, the narratives. Allegory. The yeah. allegory, yes. The Puranas, uh, allegory. I would, and again, I'd like to reinstate that. I would say that the Agamas are the literal for sure, because those are the practical applying of how to go from A to B to C to D in whatever practice that you're trying to do, the process, the technique, etc. Uh, so, but again, nuanced. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, go on, Premanandji. So I actually wanted to echo what you said, uh, Rahulji. Um, I'm on my channel reading many of the scriptures, and personally, I'm right now in book four of Valmiki's Ramayana. And if you've read that version of the Ramayana, there's parts of it where you're just like, really? Really? That 16,000 soldiers just marched for a day and then turned around and went back? Okay, that makes no sense. You know, you, you mentioned it, you shoot one arrow and 20 appear and they go 100 miles. It seems absurd. And uh, even when you're reading the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's things you're just like, so we had seven continents? Okay, Gonna I don't know how to work with this. But one thing I say quite often in my videos is, these are scriptures for a reason, not just because they're old, not just because some people like them, but because they have value. And we may not quite get it. We may not believe them. We may think they are absolute absurd fiction. I'm being devil's advocate here. But there's something in them that is valuable. And so I'm always saying Try to find the value in the scripture. Yes, Rama and Lakshmana and Sita are out here talking, but what is the essence of what they're saying, even if you think the conversation never happened? What is the essence? Because for me, that that can probably touch you on a better level. We, we Many of you mentioned the personal aspect, and, and that's a really important thing. So I just want to echo what you say is that it may not be believable, but there's more to it than just these stories. There's something that we can get and we, you know, we shouldn't um, just throw them out the window if we don't like them. We should find something of value. I, I, I've, I've said that so many times in my videos that I now chop it out because I feel like I'm repeating myself. <laughs> but I think it's an important thing to remember. Don't throw them out the window. That's all. <laughs> I, I just want to say I really liked what you said about the essence, understanding the essence. That is really what they're there for, um, is to understand the essence for sure. That's what I feel yeah. anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Actually, yeah, I just got a reminder come to me through the mention of, of Rama and Sita that uh, I remember listening to a discourse about how in the Ramayana, Rama represents the Atman and Sita represents the Jiva and Ravana with ten heads represents the ten Indriyas, the five Karmendriyas of the locomotion of the body and the five Gyanendriyas of, of the five senses of knowledge represents our senses that take us into the world. And of course, Sita was captured by this 
this demon of ten heads, the ten material senses, and Brahma, the Atman, had to fight to really have that that jiva back under its its domain in order to experience the the love between Rama and Sita, between the Atman, the true unlimited self, and the and the limited individual self, but one through we experience bhakti and jnana and going to a guru and experiencing the world in this spiritual path. So I think that's one way. If you just Listen to Ramayana with this. You imagine, okay, Ram means this, Sita means this, Rava mean, means this. And you get this extra layer of meaning that just like infuses the story with, with practical and philosophical and immediate realization due to the interaction of all the characters. Yeah, I love that. Um, so we'll go to the next question, uh, which is, a good one because I think um, you kind of touched upon it, Liam. Uh, what are the pitfalls that can occur in bhakti? Um, so this is quite an important one, actually. Uh, so Shivaji, we'll start with you again. Well, bhakti means emotion, my friends, and uh, there are pitfalls in becoming uh, emotional. You can become too emotional. And your logic goes out the window. This reminds me of something that Sadhguru Jagi Vasudev said that a long time in India there was a bhakti movement. And it arose because people weren't allowed to go into temples. They were segregated based on their various other things, uh, based on their caste and the whole system, how it was running. So the bhakti movement arose. And since it was that my own body is a temple, that the, my legs are the pillars, my body is a temple, and my top of the head is the, the deity. So when this happened, people were so emotional that they threw science out of the window. So a lot of the science as to how temples were built was lost. So that's a huge pitfall in bhakti. In a larger sense, are there any pitfalls in spirituality? The only pitfalls, if you're going towards liberation and mukti, is stopping or slowing down and be turning around. Anything else you can overcome, it doesn't matter, actually. If you lose science or if you don't lose science or if you're emotional, if you're not emotional, you have to get there. You have to go towards ultimate liberation because that is the most important thing in our lives. Everything else is just nonsense. And how do you get there? Well, you have to meditate. So meditate and gain your ultimate liberation. Let's, let's all do that. Thank you, Shivaji. Brahmananji. So uh, I'm actually going to give a short answer to this out of character for me. <laughs> um, I see, uh, well, I have two points. Two points I want to bring up. One is are there really pitfalls or are these actually learning moments? And in which case they're not really a pitfall. It's just a step going up and going up and going up, hopefully going up. And maybe we just sort of missed the step and we're kind of where we are. We're not falling back down. Or even if we do, we're still on the stairs going up. So I don't know. I don't know if, if in this spiritual realm, we have dramatic real pitfalls. It's, you know, uh, it's not like a lawyer who loses a case. You know, we're, we're always sort of growing in some way, shape or form. And even when we fall all the way down, and I say this as an ex-devotee of Adidas Samraj, which I just turned away from, I still was growing. And I was, ha and, it, and at the end of the day, like, was it 14 years later, I don't see that as a pitfall anymore. So that's the first point. And the second one is uh, a little bit more specific for me, instead of listing pitfalls, I'm just going to say what they are is, is Maya. I see them as Maya. Um, and that might be Maya that we create or Maya from outside of us that's being created. Maybe depends on your view of what Maya is. Um, I, I tend to see things like, um, 
Well, I, I'm going to reference pop culture here because some of us might watch the TV show Doctor Who. And in Doctor Who, the doctor is trapped in this castle and he has to get out of it by smashing this crystal wall. But he hits it once and then has to go through this maze. And then he hits it again, has to go through the maze. And he does this like nine billion times. And then finally the wall is broken apart and he escapes. And that's actually how I see Maya is we hit it. And we hit it again and we hit it again and we hit it. It's not one big punch like we're the rock and we break the whole thing down. You know, we're not a superhero. It's just these little taps. And so it's it's like, yes, we, we hit it and we have to go through the maze again. And that might be our pitfall, but it's really not. We're slowly getting there. We're slowly getting to our goal. And with patience, we will eventually get there. So I don't really see pitfalls so much. I just see... We're, we're trapped in this thing. We're trapped in Maya. And it's just this learning experience. So, yeah, that's all. I, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Primananji. Edwinji. Thank you. I, um, so I would approach it from this direction is that um, just like you said, it's not a pitfall. It's what you are trying to achieve in your life. So if you're wanting to be a, 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 a sadhu, um, a yogi, um, you're not uh, wanting to have anything to do with the lila of life when it comes to society, any goals, generating a good or bad karma, or um, even just working on burning karma. If you want to have that oneness, that bliss, and get into such bhakti, that I believe there's a story of where uh, a yogi had his hand cut off and he didn't, he was in such bhakti, he did not even know it until one of, uh, someone came up and gave him or told him that his hand, he, he had, someone had just cut his hand off and he said, just bring it to me. And it, it, it did not phase him. It did not hurt him. He was not attached, literally. Um, and it's one of those things where if you're wanting to achieve that and that is your goal in life and that's where you're trying the state you're trying to achieve then absolutely go full bhakti um but at the same time if you're trying to interact with the world there needs to be a balance of bhakti and jnana there has to be a, a balance uh you have to to utilize the knowledge um and and that that level of uh, accountability for maintaining that balance um you know if you're wanting to make changes in the world or uh go in and, and interact and and you know uh you know make a change um or be the change you, you need to apply jnana and and karma and it can't just be um bhakti uh, if that's your goal. But if your goal is to be in pure bliss and, and pure oneness with Brahman or whatever form, Deva, Devata, that you're connecting through or for to that one source of Brahman, then go for it. It's not a bad thing. It's just what you're your your what what you're trying to achieve. What is your what is your end goal? Uh, and what are you willing to give up to get to that point? Sacrifice. So that's where I will go with that. Thank you, Edwin G. Liam G. I really like what the sentiment has been shared so far about, you know, on the spiritual path, there's only teachable moments. However, it is important to know what kind of teachable moments appear on the on the path of bhakti and probably the most obvious one that we see in many religions around the world is that it can become mechanical that we are just going through the motions without carrying the bhav the sentiments in our heart we do our prayers we do our mantras we do the puja we do the darshan but you know, millions of people do this and still do not attain ultimate liberation. So something more has to happen than just uh, bhakti. In the Bhagavad Gita, I think Krishna emphasizes this, that there's really five different 
well, depending on how you count, five, four, five, or six different yogas that Krishna recommends, all of them coming together. Bhakti is one of them, but karma yoga is another, jnana yoga, ashtanga yoga, dhyana yoga, um, raja yoga. But I think one that really brings them all together, and it's and it's mentioned almost almost scarcely, is buddhi yoga the yoga of the intellect, that we must use discernment so that, you know, our mental faculties are fully engaged and we're not just going through the physical motions of any of these practices. Thank you, Liam G. Vince G. Okay, we got it. So... Should so the the question was should bhakti so are there are there pitfalls when taking bhakti too far is that the question right yeah like what are the pitfalls that can occur in bhakti pitfalls right yeah so my understanding is bhakti is a form of devotion maybe to a murti which is um which is a statue or an image or a depiction um so once again my answer is going to it's not there every answer I give is pretty much never going to be broad stroke for everyone. It depends on how your mind works. Um, if you have a very dualistic understanding, then maybe the bhakti path might turn it into maybe, uh, you know, as we see in Christianity, um, that it's taken literally and, you know, they worship images and that's a bhakti form of, of, of yoga. It, it's, it's a way of connecting. Um, that's a bhakti form. Um, so, if you take it literally, then it can, it can lead to pitfalls. Um, but that's why uh, it just depends on how your mind works. Um, I would personally go uh, to the jnani path of knowledge first to get an understanding of the differences between non-duality and duality so that we're not taking the bhakti too far. Um, that's where the pitfalls can come in because then we'll start thinking that maybe the mortities or the images or the things that we're devoting to have its has its own standalone existence apart from the self which is not true as we find in buddhism and and and, and uh, advaita vedanta um we call this um codependent arisings or um interdependent arisings things come and go together um and oh, i think the sanskrit word for that would be drishti shristi vada which means codependent arisings they rise and fall together and so that's the pitfall that can sort of come if we take the uh the bhakti path too literally yes if, if we don't have an understanding of the difference between duality and non-duality thank you uh thank you everyone those answers are really good um actually i like really what you said Brim and Anji, about um the learning moments and i think that is if one truly understands what bhakti is it, it is all about learning moments there is only progress on the path uh, one thing that i have found f being on the path for many years is that um the biggest cause that i see people get blocked in or get uh, confused is when it becomes similar to blind faith so without the gyan element uh, the knowledge element or buddhi yoga uh, it's very easy for us to get into bhakti but forget what we're actually worshiping even though we're doing it as someone said we're doing it mechanically but we're we're not actually doing it with the reverence and love and intensity that we did before uh, and we've forgotten its true cause and uh, growing up, I've always been told that the first step in bhakti is to first know the ultimate reality. That's the first step. If you've not uh, established that first step, then this path of bhakti is one that can just create confusion or it becomes very ritualistic. And actually, whenever something becomes ritualistic, we we tend to not fully enjoy what bhakti is you know the rus of bhakti that's not fully enjoyed the the juice or the 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 nectar of bhakti is not truly indulged in properly so i do feel that um knowledge is very important wisdom vivek the discernment 
between the real and the unreal. When bhakti is based on that, then there's very less pitfalls. But yeah, we got to be careful that it doesn't become ritualistic. It doesn't become something we do um, mechanically. It's not something we do out of blind faith because we think we're going to get something you know for example if i think i'm going to worship ganeshi and he's going to remove all the obstacles to liberation and that's all i'm going to focus on why would ganeshi work for us if that's all we're going to rely upon we do have to put some action into that uh, we do have to um you know understand what shiva really is in that in that light because he's the one that removes obstacles for us to know shiva who then brings liberation so yeah um but before i even uh before i take it to an open discussion um one thing i will say is that uh, all the paths that liamji mentioned they all lead to liberation and somehow one way or another they all interconnect and interrelate with each other and and that's the beauty of the Bhagavad Gita because it shows you how it how it happens uh, literally for Arjun and the Mahabharata also shows after uh, that that process um so yeah thank you everyone so I'll open the floor if anyone wants to say anything Edwin G I'll see you ready uh, and then we'll go to you Vince G so based off of my experience uh and witnessing and being to you know up to a dozen if not more temples throughout the United States from one coast to another and different Sampradaya's uh, temples, not just my own Sangha's. But I have seen uh, like the ritualistic aspect of, of Puja, Nabi Shekham. You, you, there will be times with most of them where you'll see like that pure bhakti element that's still there in the ritual that they're doing. And, why, and they know why they're doing it. But then there will be some that are, you can see it's almost like they, they're dead in their eyes. There's no, there's no joy, there's no love, there's no devotion, there's no nothing. They're just doing the motions. And you can feel the difference between the ones who are doing it out of bhakti and the ones who are doing it based off just the jnana and just the, the movements of it. And um, that is a pitfall right there. I would say going the other way is when people get too ritualistic within doing it. No, it's not. It's not a bad thing that they're getting ritualistic. It's just they. It's become such a repetitive aspect that they've lost the joy for which they started. They've lost that connection because of whatever whatever issues they're having internally that are not allowing them to connect because it's become such routine for them. They, they, I've seen it where they will, um, there's times, and maybe this is just me, but in addition to that, I've also seen where uh, instead of doing the mantras for the Abhishekam or the Puja, um, like really putting that in there, the bhakti, the, the, that essence in there, um, I see a very like quick get it over with, like, do it really fast and just get it over with and it's it's like i look at them and i'm like why like in mentally i'm like why if you no longer want to do this don't do it but don't pretend to do it and just get it over with you've had a long day oh I need to get this over with let me just get it let's get it done so i can go eat prasad and go home like that that's like the mentality that i am getting from that when i'm hearing them do the abhishekams or the pujas to the murtis and um I, it very much makes me kind of go uh kind of curl up inside like wow like that didn't feel good like you know what i mean and so you can feel the difference between those who do and those who don't and that's where i would put that thank you edwin g uh, vince g i saw that you had your hand up well you kind of basically stole my thunder. You said exactly what I was going to say. Um, so as, as a, as a Gyani, I think you're, you took the path of, of Gyani as well. It's when you realize you're what you are and, or what you are not um, from a neti neti point of view, um, bhakti and karma yoga, the, the selflessness, the, the path of devotion, 
it's, it's a natural occurrence that sort of blossoms out of the understanding from the Gyani perspective. So it's not, and, and this might be my Mahayana middle way uh, way of speaking, but it's not that we do it. It's just, I, it's as soon as you understand what, the true self, it's a natural blossoming or a flowering of, so I, I feel like one just kind of like bleeds into the other. And it just, uh, so I, I agree with what you said, host. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vilji. Liam G, I see that you, you raised your hand. <laughs> well, Rahul G, I wanted to mention, since uh, you had mentioned that in the Bhagavad Gita, it's alluded to that all these paths, especially the main three, Bhakti, Karma, Jnana, are, are all one in some way, that they're not just different paths that lead to the same place. They are the same path. And I'm really grateful that in the past few months, this has become really realizable for me. The connection between karma yoga and bhakti yoga is, is very simple. It's if you're engaging as if everything is devoted to the ultimate, whatever ishta deva you have or lack thereof, that you go about each and every one of our karmas, our actions with bhakti, we do it for serving the atman within everyone, then karma becomes bhakti. And it took me a while to to kind of understand how the jnana comes into this until I, I realized that, well, if you're just changing your behavior to reflect the fact that everything becomes a service, a seva, then you're working from the principle that you are the Atman, that you are one with Brahman. Why? Because the assumption that you have enough to give implies that you are whole, that you are infinite. And the more we change our behavior, our karma, to reflect this, then the jnana comes as a natural consequence because we see the immediate truth of the fact that acting in accordance with our higher self in this way, with paramatma, just makes sense. And it becomes beyond shravana, manana, nididhyasana, it becomes shat, shat Sakshatkar, where it's a realizable truth because you immediately see that your actions are entirely in alignment with the truth that you are going into the actions with. I think in this way, these three paths become one. Beautiful. Thank you. Anybody else want to add anything? I think we're good. We'll go to the next question. Um, how can a seeker prepare themselves for the highest realization? We probably have alluded to this in the uh, in some of our answers, but I think we can always make it precise. Um, uh, I think Shivaji has gone on manifest right now, so we'll <laughs> go to Premananji. All right, missing in action. Um, so I. I um, talk about one thing a lot on my channel all the time because it's something I've run into with people. And so I think this is, uh, well, um, I'm always talking about self-awareness. You need self-awareness um, and also honesty. You need to be honest about yourself. And I think those two things are foundation stones for then preparing yourself for higher realization. I, I think if you're not honest about yourself and you don't have any self-awareness, I just think spirituality becomes a sort of a game. Um, uh, uh, you know, I have a friend who thinks she's the most devout Christian in the world, but she is absolutely the most nastiest person you've ever been around. And everyone avoids her. And I'm like, you kind of lack some self-awareness here. So how deep can you get in your realization if you don't really know yourself? And I, I always talk about like that for me is just you, you can prepare yourself for other things. And that's where you're going to start is with self-awareness, intellectual honesty, and moving off from there, uh, uh, being mindful, I think is very important. And they all kind of connect together and overlap. Um uh, Vivek, as you mentioned earlier, Rahulji, um, also asking questions like Ramana Maharshi's Who Am I? I? I'm a big fan of his, and I think that's just like an amazing question to ask. Um, 
And that goes with the digging into the honesty and the self-awareness and just finding yourself. Because my thing is, is when you dig in and you find your, your jiva and who you really are beyond this, this physical thing, when you really get in there, then you're going to start putting yourself in line with God and um, why you're here, your purpose in this world. Um, so I think I mention those things all the time. And I think they're really important for just setting yourself up for that highest realization. Um, I'd also mention um, uh, uh, learning about different teachers, maybe following teachers, maybe not following a teacher if they're taking you down a bad road. Um, also understanding that bad road, finding out what it is. If you're going in the wrong place, we've all been mentioning, you know, the intellectual side here, stop and go, okay, I may feel it, but things aren't looking right here. This guy named Jim Jones, I don't know, I'm not feeling it, you know, be willing to back up. Um, and uh, I would also want to add just in conclusion, like some practice of non-attachment is really good too. But the fact is, I think that's probably one of the hardest things for us to do and almost nearly impossible. People say they're not attached to stuff, but I guarantee if any of us were homeless tomorrow, or our parents died, or our loved ones died, or we lost everything we had and all our money, we'd be very emotionally invested in that. So we're not really practicing on attachment, you know? So that's a hard one, but some sense of whatever, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's just for me, it, it's just, I, we've like you said already, we've already touched on this question in a roundabout way. Um, and I know I always talk about in terms of self-awareness and then these other little steps. So yeah, that's just a big picture. Next person. <laughs> and thank you, Premanan G. Edwin G. Can you repeat the question, Aya? Sure. Um, how can a seeker prepare themselves for the highest realization? That is a journey that I would put this much forward. That you need, as Prema Man, the G, am I saying that right? Um, said with a needing a, a guru, right? That's a good step. But also when you're getting to that level where you are coming close to that realization, you need, it's not just a mental or an emotional or a psychological thing. It's also a physical thing. And to prepare the body will also prepare the mind. So if you're preparing, if you want to prepare your ability to take this in and not have a breakdown when receiving it, you need to be able to detox the body, to detox the mind. So, for example, there's Ayurveda, right? Different aspects of Ayurvedic herbs that help to detox the body and prepare one for yogic practices, like neem and haritaki, etc. Right? Um, but then going from there, once you've done the necessary level of detoxing, um, and then and continuing that practice um and and uh going from there and going to a guru and then following the processes of that and he will prepare you for that realization anything that you are missing when it comes to uh receiving that 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 um, realization and so that's where i will put that Thank you, Edwin G. Just before I go to um, Liam G, uh, Shiva G's power's gone out and uh, his cellular data isn't uh, being the best. So um, hopefully the power comes back and he can return. Um, but yeah, uh, Liam G. I think the most important thing we can do on the spiritual path to prepare for liberation is to continue being humble, keeping an open mind. What ultimately prevents us is feeling like, like we've accomplished something that we don't have any more to go. As long as we are thinking like that, then we will be stuck. And 
we have to hollow ourselves out of of forms of ego which make us feel like we are higher than others or that we've we've learned enough that there's always something more for us to do having such humility i think is so important because it creates the space for for grace for paramatma to shine through and to really feel like this whole vessel this whole body this whole mind becomes a temple for for brahman to get to experience itself and that requires taking ourself minimizing our lower self and maximizing our higher self Thank you, Liam Chi. Uh, Vince Chi. So it depends again. Um, if you are very devotion, if you if you're very devotional, if that's how just how you you work, if that's how your makeup works, if you're very devotional, then I'm going to take a quote from my original guru, which is Thich Nhat Hanh, the famous Buddhist monk um, from Vietnam, and he says sometimes. Your smile is the source of your happiness, and sometimes your happiness is the source of your smile. And so, if you're very devotional, I would say, do acts of kindness. You know, do things like maybe go volunteer at a soup kitchen, or do just do selfless acts of kindness to sort of facilitate that and and to sort of get you to embody the understanding and then it'll it'll naturally just it'll naturally just eventually um the understanding will just come to you i don't know i don't and that's just what they would call grace and i don't have any rhyme or reason for that um but i'll speak to the gyani aspect of it because i'm more of a gyani um for me if you if you are very logically minded then you need to what liam said absolutely that's exactly what i was going to say you need to come with your glass half empty or as empty as possible humble yourself if you're coming in there with a very rigid form of of logic and you don't understand that there's eastern logic there's tetralemma logic there's not just the very rigid forms of binary logic that we find here in the west and so if you're going to bring that sort of baggage with you it's going to inhibit you from truly understanding what sanatana dharma and what advaita vedanta is um I see the wording is I see there's higher understanding, of course, as a as a strict as a strict yani, I don't like to use hierarchical language. <laughs> it sounds very dualistic. So I try to stay away from that as much as possible. Um, enlightenment, I guess is what we're talking as far as the higher understanding. Um, I think that's what we're referring to enlightenment or self-realization. Now, everyone is already so enlightenment's already the case. I want everyone to understand this. There is no, there is no possessor of enlightenment. There is no owner of enlightenment. Enlightenment is already the case, and so the only thing that we need to do <clears throat> is to investigate all the things that have obfuscated this obvious, this this simplistic, this um, this readily like it's it's the most obvious overlooked thing, and so. The process of neti neti in Buddhism, which is I am not that, I am not that. It's uh, Narga, Nagarjuna also talked about this. It's an ultimate reductio. He would that's why he started the school of Mahayana. Um, it's the ultimate reductio. I am not this, I am not that. And so, if you can humble yourself and really do a, a reductio based argument on your actual experience of the world, you will come to this conclusion. But it always starts with humbleness. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vinci. Thank you, everyone. Yes, um, humility is the biggest thing. Uh, humility and honesty, as we've heard. I think if we do not have that, uh, we cannot know where we really are on the journey. Um, and yes, uh, because I'm uh, part of the, I believe in Advaita Vedanta, the, the concept is that you are already Brahman and there's... Um, and you have to remove whatever is veiling that reality in your day-to-day -day life. And obviously, this is where bhakti actually is pretty cool and helpful. Um, like For example, sense restraint. Instead of focusing that you're taking everything in as a sense, you're offering it to the divine. 
So automatically, it's not coming to the ego self. If one is truly doing the bhakti. Uh, same thing with um, if we are uh, desiring something. Uh, that desire we offer to Brahman we, or our Ishtevta. We say it's not our desire. Let go, we want to let go of that desire. Even if that desire is for liberation, uh, one should offer that to Brahman. Because again, that, become, that becomes a concept or an idea and that can get us stuck. Uh, and the one thing that Brahmananji said, and it's one that I, I get asked about a lot and um, it's, it's a, it is very difficult, the non-attachment or detachment aspect of life. Yes, um, and this is where I like Advaita Vedanta quite a bit. And sometimes a lot of Advaitins or shall I say, the Neo-Advaitins, uh, miss this very uh, good explanation that Adi Shankaraji gave, which was you have the relative reality and you have the ultimate reality. So, yes, you as Brahman are in the ultimate reality, but you also possess, you are embodying a body and a mind. Now, that is in the relative reality. Now, whatever happens in the relative reality, as long as you understand it does not affect the ultimate reality, you're good. Um, the relative reality, yes. If um, I, I give this example all the time, that if somebody punches me in the face, I can't turn around and say, I never got punched. It wasn't real. It, it, it's just unrealistic. Uh, no, yes, my, my body's going to feel that punch um, or... Uh, or whatever that may be. So people miss this understanding of the relative reality, uh, that we need to just understand that if anything is affecting us, what is it truly affecting? And if we truly reflect, then we see it's just affecting the body and the mind. And then we can do those steps where we can discern how that is unreal and what is real. And then we can come back to peace. So I always believe like for example, if there's a death in the body, a death of a loved one, uh, I think Swami Deyanandaji, who is um, Swami Tadatmanandaji's guru, uh, I remember listening to an interview he gave, and I can't, I can't remember the documentary. I wish I could remember what it was, but it was really, really good. And he, uh, they said that once um, his a childhood friend passed away and he was told this before his Bhagavad Gita class and they said that you know he had a tear in his eye and you know he was visibly kind of upset that his friend had passed on uh, and then when he was told oh the class is waiting for you he just got out of uh, you know he removed the tear and he went straight to the class and acted as if nothing happened. But obviously, if you're an attendant and you just witnessed this, you would ask this question, what happened? Did he not, does he still not feel anything? And then uh, the attendant asked afterwards, why did you, um, you were upset, but as soon as I told you the class was uh, was had to begin, you got up and as if nothing had happened. And he says, yes, I had to grieve over a friend. It is upsetting that my friend died. But then when you told me the class had to begin, I remember the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita and that helped me bring detachment back uh, and understand that my friend has actually hasn't gone anywhere. He's just changed his costume, you know, as the famous line in the Gita is. So yeah, uh, those are my few words. Um, but th those are a few things that we can prepare ourselves. Obviously one that I, I truly, uh, two things I truly believe in is uh, understanding scriptures in the right way like we've uh, established earlier today and also uh, having a guru is really good to have or having several i don't think you can just have one you can have several um that can help you on this path then you can learn from each and every guru in my opinion uh, so yes so now um i don't think um the powers come back from for shivaji so uh, anyone wants to add anything uh vince G? yeah yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a comment about what you were talking about as far as the neo advaitins um, This is what happens when a sort of dualistic mindset will come in and sort of pervert the understanding. They're stuck. What, I'm, what I would say is there's a famous saying by Ramana Maharshi 
and it goes in three stages. It's it's the world is unreal, the way we normally perceive it, you know, the Maya. Um, only Brahman is real. Brahman is the world. So the Neo Advaitins are stuck in the second stage. They're stuck in Nirvi Kalpa Samadhi. And that's where they're at. And they say, nothing to do, no one here, no one to meditate. And they, and they, and so and that might be helpful to a very small percentage of people, but for someone else, that just sounds like it sounds like nihilism. And um, the final stage after that would be Sahaja Samadhi, which is which is den a denial of nothing. It's 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 a denial of nothing. It's 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 saying it's it's the 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 knowing of yourself in the presence of objects because there is no separation anymore. So I just wanted to touch on that because the neo advaitins I you know while they they are helpful to maybe some people are in the beginning stages to sort of get them out of their way of thinking. I don't think it's very helpful um, because of that reason with what you said because it can be perverted. And it can be used to justify nihilism. And that's just not what this is. And I just wanted to reiterate that point. Thank you. Thank you, Vinci. Anyone else? Yes, I would uh, build off Anything. of... Thank you. Um, I would um, build off of um, uh, Vince's point is that um, <clears throat> I <clears throat> absolutely believe that Nirvokalpa Samadhi uh, is absolutely a useful thing is definitely something that is used by you know gurus but it's not something um that uh, unless the guru is teaching that of of the way that it's supposed to be applied that it's something that people should just be taking up willy-nilly um it's definitely um uh, uh, a a a stepping stone to uh uh mahasamadhi um and um absolutely any type of samadhi should be treated with um reverence and uh understanding of with with a certain level of responsibility for yourself and others um and 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 not uh abusing or misusing that samadhi um and it, it's definitely why um a guru is is necessary for those higher states and practices to guide you through that because uh, many will uh, jump into it and misuse those practices for themselves uh, and their interaction with the world. Uh, so, yeah, that's where I'm at. Thank you, DMG. Yeah, I wanted to touch on the point of grief that you mentioned, Rahulji, that no matter how far we progress on the spiritual path, even if one ends up being enlightened, grief is still going to occur. And I don't believe it's a form of ignorance whatsoever, as if you're not fully understanding what it means to be the Atman, which is beyond these things. I believe that grief is a very practical thing, that whenever we have a receptacle of love, since we have a source of love in our heart, it just starts generating all sorts of ways in which we can love. And sometimes the separation between that source and that receptacle happens prematurely, maybe through the loss of a loved one, maybe through a breakup, and still our heart's carrying all this love. But now we have to go through the process of changing the receptacle since we don't have the physical presence anymore to give that love to them directly we have to start reorganizing restructuring our heart and all that grief is just the unexpressed love coming out in a different way and i think that's beautiful no matter where one is on the path to liberation i agree with that yeah um and um yeah i think i think grief actually is um, I think it was Shivaji that mentioned the story of the Buddha and going to the cemetery. And it's something uh, I, I remember um, one of my mentors, spiritual mentors, mentioned uh, once that sometimes we forget death is going to happen to us as well. You know, even though we see the other people, uh, other persons died or a loved one has died, but we can forget our own mortality in that 
in that process. And he says, if you visit a crematorium or a burial site every week, you'll start understanding this is going to happen to you. And actually, I think that's where the fear of death comes from, because we haven't addressed our own mortality. And once you address your own mortality, it's kind of, it, there is a release that happens. Um, and you realize that actually, um, what is this body? And what is this, the what is this attachment to the body too? Um, that inquiry goes in. So that's, yeah. Um, uh, did anyone else want to add anything? Brimananji, please. So you guys are talking about death here and, um, I'm not going to talk about death. I'm going to slightly <laughs> change the change the focus. Uh, but it got me thinking about just emotions in general. I spent a summer practicing at the San Francisco Zen Center, you know, getting up at 4.30 a.m. to meditate for hours on end. And um, one of the most vivid moments of that was when one of the senseis said to a small group of us that were studying, I forget, it doesn't matter, she said, uh, when you achieve this enlightenment or whatever you may call it, you don't stop having emotions. Actually, you feel them intensely were her words. You feel that sorrow. You feel whatever is happening and you're just very present in the moment. And that just stuck with me. Um, and you know, fast forward 20 something years now since, since I did that. And I've run into a lot of people who seem to think that, well, if you're going to become realized or you're going to have Satori or whatever you want to call it, Nirvana, you have no emotions. And I've run into so many people like, yes, I don't feel anything because I'm, I'm enlightened. I'm like, eh. I'm just like, no, that's it. That's not it. You're, you're going to be a robot. That's not what God's calling you to be. You, you know, we have emotions. They're part of human nature. Um, I actually met a guy once. He was like, yes, I, I'm beyond emotions and I'm beyond feelings. And I'm actually going to be a very rude person to most people because I don't care about you even. I don't even have empathy. And and so I, I think that's, a, a, I don't know where that came up with, where people think that that you don't have emotions. But no, you actually feel the grief, like Liam said. You, you actually feel these things, and they're very real things to us because we're living in this, this real world, as you were talking about. Um, so I, I, that just came into my head while you guys were talking. Uh, just, uh, just throw that in there. Also to steer away from the depressing death topic. <laughs> Uh, it's yeah. one of my favorite topics, so you know. <laughs> uh, but jokes aside, well, well, then go for it, and I will figuratively punch you. And uh... <laughs> um, but I actually really loved what you said about. Um, I just wanted to touch upon. Yeah, I think um, true enlightenment it doesn't take you away from your humanity. Uh, you still have that humanness in you. Um, um, I think it was the Buddha that said, um, an enlightened being is a human being, very simply, you know, so yeah, totally agree. Um, Vince, I saw oh. you going to say something. Uh, oh, Edwin. Yeah. yeah, just, I was just, it's really quick. I was just going to say, listen, Brahman rejects nothing. And so when you know your true self to be Brahman, it is a rejection of nothing. You don't, reject emotions you don't reject feelings you don't reject anything everything is accepted um there is no discrimination in brahman and so just want to reiterate that point. um i would put in i agree with you um vince but i will also Praman, um forgive me for not getting the name right Praman, Pramananda uh das um when I would say I agree with you on the whole no emotion aspect, but I would also say that depending on the state of consciousness, the practice, the sadhana, whether you're, if you're like I brought up before, like yogis getting into a certain level of bhakti where pain and suffering, where they're not able to, they don't feel it. Like if you're in that state, but if you're just living in the world and you're just doing stuff and you say, I'm enlightened. And I don't feel emotion, then yeah, that's that's BS. But there are practices, there are there are levels of yo yogic practices, and you know, yogis out there that get into that state of of bhakti to such a high extent that 
all the, the senses are no longer connected to that, their experience. So they're no longer experiencing anything that happens to the body. Uh, it no longer affects them. But that is that is different than someone saying, I'm enlightened and I don't feel emotions. I'm just making that clear. Like those are two separate things. And those yogis aren't claiming to be enlightened. They're just being in such a deep space of, of oneness and, and uh, that they're at such a state of, of samadhi and such a state of, of bhakti that they're not feeling anything other than pure bliss, pure bliss. Um, and so um, that's where I would put that. That's how I would explain that. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we'll go to the final question. And um, if we have time, uh, we can even open the floor up for the chat to have any questions. Otherwise, um, I have a plan for part three, actually. Uh, so the final question is, what is God or Brahman? Uh, whichever word we want to use and uh, Shiva, whatever was good for us. Uh, so yeah, Brahmananji. So I was thinking about this and thinking about how we could point to some scripture and go, okay, well, this is, this is Brahman. We could also have a discussion how the word Brahman and God aren't the same word. They have different meanings. We could also talk about like, um, already is the present all knowing. We could start putting out all these words but then I was thinking about all of us here and, and even Shiva and how we all have very personal connections to God. And, and that's probably why we are here is because it's something we feel. We didn't just read a book and go, oh, that line's great. OK. And we believed it was more than that. So I actually kind of wanted to tell a story. And since this is the last question, if you'll give me a moment to tell a story, something that happened to me. Um, so I mentioned in the first uh uh, part one that I'm a writer and since I was a little boy I always wanted to write a music biography I mean, it's obvious that I play music and I always wanted to write a music biography that was just my dream and I was in my late 30s and nothing was happening and I tried and it was just whatever but it was just that elusive thing that I wanted to make me feel like I had achieved my writing so about 10 years ago on um, I, uh, I, I'm staying with my parents in between an apartment and uh, I get home from work and I turn on my computer and there's an email from a friend of mine who's a book publisher in Japan and he says, I have someone who is a musician. He is a very famous jazz bass player. Would you like to write his memoir? He has been told about you. He thinks like he's definitely interested. This could be an awesome deal for you. And he knows you're a musician. He knows you play bass. I know, is this, would you like to do it? And so I read this email. I went, OMG, like, this is what I've been waiting for my entire life. And like, I don't really like the guys playing. Um, I'd seen videos of him, but I never met him. But he played with like Herbie Hancock and John McLaughlin and Sonny Rollins and actually was on MTV. And very few jazz guys can say they had a song on MTV. So this is like a guy who's super, super famous. And he's in a band that lots of people know, but I'm just not going to name him. And I was like, yes, this is it. So I wrote an email back like, absolutely. When can we talk? Oh, he's in Japan. OK, I will stay up to one o'clock in the morning if need be. This is what I've been waiting for all my life. And at this point in my time, my writing wasn't making any money. Anyways, um, fast forward a couple days, get home again from work. And I just want to say, I don't do drugs. I didn't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do anything. Uh, I get on my computer. I open it up. There's an email. So-and-so is ready to go with this. He just wants to do a, a phone conversation with you. And I took my hands and uh, I put them on the back. I was standing up and I put them on the back of my chair, kind of like this. And I just gripped the chair. And the next thing I knew, I was through the floor, literally through the floor. And the floor was right here. And I was stopped by going down and I was looking underneath my desk. Then, like seconds later, I was back looking at my computer as though, well, what had just happened? 
this what the heck and a voice was in my head that just said no you cannot do this and if you do your life will be a train wreck and i was like what the what i had no it was just this weird thing like i just fell to the floor and i okay so i wrote to my friend and i said sorry i can't do it i can't tell you why i can't explain why someday i will and I just sent off the email and I'm like, okay, that was really weird. There's no hole in the floor, but I clearly felt like I fell through and I went downstairs to my living room and or my parents' living room. And I was looking up like, there's no hole here. What, what's going on? I, that was so weird. And I said to my mom, I said, well, I said no to the project. And she's like, well, why'd you do that? I'm like, I don't know. But a voice told me to say no to my dream. I don't know why. And I just, I forgot about it. So a couple of days later, I get an email from my friend going, what the hell is wrong with you? And how could you do this to me? You've embarrassed me. And I'm like, well, if you don't want to talk to me, fine. I just like, I have to say no to this. I don't know why. So he doesn't talk to me. <laughs> but a month or so later, I get an email from him and goes, I don't know what you did, but you saved yourself because the guy and I got in a major argument. I released an album by him gave him $20,000 and he says it's a loan and I can't get the money back. He cheats everyone. He screws people over and he's in numerous lawsuits and he is untrustworthy and you probably would have wasted your time, your money, your energy and have a project that never wouldn't have happened. And he doesn't really care. My friend said he just wants to become rich so he can pay medical bills. The guy's passed away and he was dying at the time. And I didn't know any of this, but it was a really weird experience I had this weird moment. I felt like I fell to the floor and I had this voice in my head going, stop, don't do your dream. I didn't know why. And then I come to find out it, it was like, it saved me from something catastrophe that I had no way of knowing any of this. Fast forward a few years. I did actually end up writing a book. That's a music biography. That was the best book that I've probably ever written. But I've always thought that that experience was a godly experience because I don't have many experiences like that. And I've had a few and they've just been like profound moment where there's a voice and it's like, do what I'm saying, don't argue with me. But if you do, you're screwed. And it's just like, this is so weird. And like I said, I don't do drugs. I don't have LSD flashbacks. I don't do any of that stuff. And I've had these moments where it's just like, don't do what you think you want to do for some reason that I, you don't know, but it'll be better for you in the end. And so whenever I think of God or Brahman, I always think of moments like that where they've been very personal to me. It's not scripture. It's not a book. Um, it's just some weird thing that happened to me where suddenly my life went to the right and then I just had to go to the left because something just told me to and it worked out amazing. Um, so that's my sort of definition of this God Brahman is something that's very personal, touches each of us in a super unique way. It's not exactly like the scriptures say it's different. It's beyond that. Um, and it's those little things that stick with us that we can't explain. I can't explain what happened to me. And I've had other things happen that I cannot explain and no one else has able to either. Um, so that's, that's how I define Brahman is just a very, very, personal personal thing and so yeah that's the end of that so last last question last story so back next person <laughs> <laughs> thank you Premanandji for sharing uh, Edwinji <clears throat> well I was so engrossed in his story that I'm now trying to uh, conceptualize how to articulate something that cannot be truly articulated. So thank you, Premam Ananda, for that uh, amazing story that now has made me put me on the spot. <laughs> thank you. Um, to be completely honest, I would say that my, it is that uh, Brahman is an experience. It is not a, something you can conceptualize. Like I was saying that it is, it is something that 
that has to be experienced to know. Um, and, and to know is to experience. Beyond that is pure intellectual and verbal garbage that does nothing more than cloud the mind rather than allowing you to an experience. So it, it can help those who may be in a deeper state of delusion to come, you can word it in such a way to explain it in a way to, at their level of understanding or their level of listening. But if you're you yourself, who have gone beyond those programmings or the conditioning that you may or may not have been raised up in, whether it was Abrahamic or not, um, to truly understand that non-dualistic aspect of Brahman, um, it is something that you must internally must internalize um, and must must come to your own realization. Um, and uh, you may be walked to that realization or you may walk to it. And beyond that, there's nothing beyond that. <laughs> Everything's beyond that, but nothing. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Edwinji. Liam G. Wow. I love these answers. I really like Premanandji's answer. That was a great uh, story. And I think they, those stories like that really infuse the spirit of bhakti because they go beyond logic, and but you can feel the sincerity in which they're shared. I'm taking this question in a, in a different direction. It comes from my red book. My red book is a book where I try to figure everything out by asking a question in one sentence, and then just the first answer that comes to my head, I write that down. And then I repeat the process. I ask a question about the answer that I've given. That way I keep going deeper and deeper. And to me, of this whole process, the deepest answer I got about God came from asking a different question. And that question is, what is an atheist? I'm just going to read these series of sentences. An atheist is someone who actively rejects the idea of God. Why? Because what they have been given as a narrative does not align with their lived experience. For example, if God is capable of preventing suffering, which is the moral thing to do, why doesn't he? If God listens to all prayers, why hasn't he answered mine? If God is everywhere, why doesn't he reveal himself? What is the common theme? There's a perceived absence of God where one has been taught to find presence. So I ask, what is the remedy? To understand God in terms of absence rather than presence. We've been taught about the presence of God, but what is God's absence? The potential for good, where we're taught to find presence, but there isn't one. Instead, there's merely the potential for goodness. Why is there a potential for good? To give us the opportunity to help. Why? For our own benefit. Why does it benefit us to be of help? To give us purpose. Why is it purposeful to be helpful? Because we are serving a higher good. What is a higher good? Something you believe to be greater than yourself. Why is it important to believe in something greater than yourself? To give others a chance to teach us something. Why? So that we can grow. Why be growing? It makes the moment meaningful. How does growing make the moment meaningful if that implies we are lacking something? Because it also entails that we are in the process of gaining something. Why do we feel that the process is secondary to the outcome? Because the outcome is what we're working towards. Why does what we're working towards hold more value than the process? Because it's what guides the process. This is the longest question. If the purpose 
of the goal is to direct the process, and the purpose of the process is to reach the goal, then what is the result of this whole feedback loop? To iteratively refine our abilities. Why? So that we become closer to realizing our full potential. Why do we have to realize our full potential? So that we have something to move towards. Why should we always be moving towards something? To be dynamic. What is appealing about being dynamic? It is productive. What is the necessity of productivity? There is so much to be done. Why does it need to be done? To fulfill our potential. Why does our potential need to be fulfilled? To give purpose to that potential so that we discover beautiful things. How shall we do so with humility? By recognizing the potential to have been in it all along. And this continues, but I'll just read the next view, and that's it. Then what is our role in unfolding that potential? To be the witness of it. Why does beauty need a witness? Because its purpose is to be seen. And we can always keep asking another question after each answer we get, but I'll pause it there for now. I think the concluding point is that God is that latent potential that exists in everything around us. And our duty is to manifest that potential, to become witness to it, to unfold it, to experience beauty. And in the process, we discover so much about ourselves as a reflection of that source within too. Thank you, Liam G. Vince G. Thank you for sharing that, Liam. That was beautiful, really. Um, wow, what a question. What is what is Brahman? To think that to think that evolved apes could using use to think that evolved apes using agreed upon mouth sounds uh which is what we're doing we call language uh, that could actually encompass what brahman is is just very ambitious uh but so maybe i'm gonna take a different approach i never know how i'm gonna answer these questions until i until it comes to me um i kind of just it just i just answer them however um it comes to me and so i would answer it like instead of saying what is brahman what is not brahman because there is no such thing as not brahman all is brahman um, Brahman is already the case. And so consciousness is another word for Brahman or isness or this awake beingness that we all share in. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a lot to say about it because you, we could never know Brahman directly. We can only be it knowingly. And I, I will say one thing that might be a little different than what uh, one of the uh, Shivji uh, said. I don't, I don't agree that Brahman is personal. Um, I believe Brahman is intimate, yes, but very impersonal. It's it's not about me. It's never it's never about me. Um, there is no separate self, so it's never going to be about my personal wants or my personal desires. Um, this is the middle path. Um, it's also known as the telos, uh, if I'm going to bring a little bit of Western philosophy into this, um, a telos or a daemon. I don't know if everyone's ever heard of the word daemon or your diamond. Um, so daemon literally translates into the impersonal will of existence working through you. Um, some would say that maybe sexual desires. So this is where it got perverted and, and translated into the Christian realm. Now, these desires or the daemon has now been translated into the word demon. That's actually where the word demon comes from. It comes from the word daemon. It's not a bad thing. It's just the impersonal will or maybe uh, the, the impersonal will of existence working through you. Like, a, like, let's say a sexual desire. Some people would say that those are demons. It's not a demon. It's your daemon. It's your diamond. If you didn't have these daemons working through you, the impersonal will of Brahman working through you, then, you know, you wouldn't reproduce. You wouldn't want to, you know, the, the, the human species wouldn't continue to propagate. So there's a, ne there's a necessity 
Um, and I think as soon as we sort of realize that existence is never about us, it's very impersonal, I think better off than most of us will be. And so, thank you. Thank you. Um, everyone gave um, really, really interesting, um, whether it's just stories or even explanations and uh, a nice inquiry. And I think that is befitting for the question, what is God or Brahman? Um, and, you know, for me, Brahman, uh, ever since I've come in contact with what initially was a word or a Shabbat, a Shabd or Shabbat, it has now become a very obvious reality that one cannot ignore. And uh, the way it was f uh, given to me uh, by my guru was that this reality, this ultimate reality, this Brahman, it is formless. And it's not that forms do not exist, but all forms are contained in this formless. It's not that images don't exist. All images are contained in this imageless. It's not like uh, colours do not exist. It is all contained in the colourless. It doesn't mean that everything is an illusion. No, it is the whole of existence. It is beyond happiness beyond sadness it is bliss itself and if someone had to tell me what is god i would say it's bliss it's love you cannot deny that experience that you get when you're one with it and uh, i think someone mentioned the intimacy the fact that you're so intimate you're so one with it you're so united with it that when you truly are in one could say a conversation with it uh, one allows this one to give its monologue rather than have a dialogue and yeah that's the beauty uh, and i want to point to a non-dual text uh, and the ashtavaka gita People think it's a conversation between Ashtavakra and Janaka. But actually, it's just pure consciousness speaking. It's, uh, I think Ramesh Bailaskar, the, uh, the non-dual teacher, his title for the book is A Duet of One. And for me, uh, that is what Brahman is. And I, so whenever I want to experience this in my day to day life in moments of meditation or in moments of just experiencing life in, in the day to day and having this conversation with you, I just remind myself that this formless isn't far away from me. It's closer than I can. It's closer than uh, as I, I normally use this uh, analogy that is closer uh, so close, it's like between your eye and the eyelid, it's right there. And uh, so, yes, so it's that intimate. Um, so, yeah, wonderful. Let's, um, we could open the f floor for any additional uh, comments. Uh, Liam G. While I was listening to Vince G's wonderful answer, something really funny occurred to me. We talk about the neti neti search of, of not this, not this, to get to Brahman. But once we get to Brahman, well, I believe the Sanskrit word neti comes from the sandhi of na and iti, which means literally not this. So this would just be iti. So you do neti neti to get to Brahman, but once you get to Brahman, then it's just iti, iti, this is Brahman, this is everything becomes Brahman. <laughs> <laughs> yes and that, um that that reminds me um when people say brahman is satchit ananda um yes that's what it means by sat is existence so yes uh, and i think it was uh, uh i think swami silverpin and there's done a few talks on this where um swami vivekananda made sure that we saw 
God in everything. Um, and uh, it becomes this, 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 and uh, everything then is just, you know, you, you get rid of that duality very easily in that process because you've done the work um, necessary for that realization to occur. Um, yeah, anyone else, please? Edwin G. <clears throat> I have nothing else to add. I just wanted to thank everybody for just being and bringing what they have to the table for all of these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Edwinji. Um, so I, I think we'll end it. Um, but before we end it, I'll let everyone give uh, closing remarks. Um, but I was thinking if we're all good, we could do a part three where the audience can ask us questions um, and uh, that way we can answer them and, uh, um, and kind of make it a bit more interactive with them uh, and still keep the panel discussion. Um, so yes, so we'll uh, just closing remarks uh, and then uh, we'll end it. Uh, Premananji. Um, I, I don't have anything to say other than it's nice to see you all again and um, and for the chitter chatter over the week since our last talk and um, thank you all of you who watched part one and are watching this or on the chat right now matter of fact which I've been reading thank you for participating and being a part of this and check each of us out on our individual social media spheres, whether it's YouTube or TikTok or wherever, please don't hesitate. If you like what we say, support us or, um, or I know, um, yeah, I, that, yeah, that's, I just wanted to say thank you. That's it. <laughs> thank you. Edwin, do you have anything to add? Uh, I know you thanked everyone, but you want to add anything? No, I just want to thank everybody watching this and hope that they re are able to internalize and receive the necessary jnana and uh, bhakti uh, from this and um, that it allows them to understand in uh, sanatana dharma on a deeper uh, level. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Edwinji. Liam. Om Namah Sorry, yes, Liam G. Yes, I I feel bad for uh, Shiva Shambhu, although I'm sure it's all part of a divine plan. I, you know, I'm sure that he would have good wishes to share, and maybe I can say on behalf of him. I don't know if I have that capacity, but I wanted to keep him him in mind as as we end this uh, without him, though we started with him. I don't know about you all, but but I started with this uh, this podcast with a bit of a tummy ache. I had some milk that had gone bad, I think. But <laughs> my body is filled with so much love and joy listening to all of you, and I'm so grateful. Thank you for being here, Premananji, Edwin Ji, Shiva Shambho Ji, and Vince Ji, and thank you, Rahul Ji, for hosting this space. It was lovely as always, and thank you for everyone who uh, came to listen to this topic. Namaskar. Thank you, Lim Ji. Vince Ji? Yes. Um, like I said, I'm honored to be here with such beautiful um, and such intelligent minds such as yourselves. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I felt very comfortable. Um, the nerves wore off almost instantly. You guys make me feel very welcome here. And um, I really enjoyed it. And namaste. I really love you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, I, I feel really good to that um, Shiva Shambhaji couldn't um, join afterwards for the couple of questions, but we'll inv invite him for part three for sure. Uh, that I guess it's typical of India to have a power cut and, <laughs> and, uh, and it happens. So, uh, yeah, it's, and I know that he's traveling as well. So, um, but, uh, and I do 
pray that wherever um, wherever he's traveling to next, it's um, full of joy um, and it's in ease. Uh, but yeah, thank you to each one of you. Um, every thought, uh, every idea or concept that's been shared today, experiences that have been shared today, have been really uplifting and have really elevated um, the the roundtable discussion from the last one. Uh, it really has, and. Uh, that's. I just want to give my heartfelt gratitude and thankfulness to all of you, um, and thank you to the listeners and the very lively uh, chat that's been going on. Um, what will happen from here is that this um, live video will go to private, and then tomorrow, the uh, the video will be uploaded uh, for uh, for everyone's viewing. Uh, but before I do uh, go, I hope that whatever we've learnt in, in these past two parts, that uh, I hope it triggers a, a real intense longing for truth in those that are seeking it. And whoever has found their answers, that, they, um, that they've enjoyed our sharing of the same reality or same experience that's been expressed uh, do check out everyone's channel uh, it's very important that you get to know everyone it's it's very uh, helpful and um, and yes until next time we'll let you know when the next live will happen uh, after we get our dates sorted um, and I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you uh, namaskar to each and every one of you and thank you thank you Bye, everybody. Take care.